if Iran decided to close the Strait of Hormuz for some reason, again, you're looking at oil prices tripling, you know, within a matter of a couple of days. And, and that it totally wrecked the U.S. economy in so many ways. I mean, we went into a recession. All right, we've got the cameras rolling. We're going to hit the ground running here. We've got a lot of fast moving things happening around the world. And the biggest topic right now that everyone wants to know is what's going on in the Middle East, Israel, a lot of conflict. We want to talk about it from a military standpoint and then also from an energy and oil standpoint, because that area is uh, historically right. That's where a lot of the oil comes from that runs the world. So we've got the guy for the story, um, a Harvard trained geologist, former naval pilot, uh, recovering <laughs> attorney and a guy that around the office at Paradigm Press we sort of call just a, a treasure trove of information when it comes to history and then current affairs and what's happening and putting them together and delivering insight. And that's Byron King. Byron, thank you so much for being with us. Let's get started here with what's happening over in Israel, what's happening from a military standpoint. And after that, let's talk oil. So get us caught up. What do we need to know? Okay. Thank you, Matt. And again, thank you everybody for watching. We really appreciate that you would be here and uh, share, you know, give us your valuable time. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, obviously, I mean, October 7th changed changed the world in a lot of ways. I mean, I'm not, you know, I don't, don't need to rehash what happened. I mean, it's just, it, you saw it in the news. Um, although my guidance or my advice to everybody is be careful what you believe in the news, because everybody has an agenda. Every video that gets posted, every comment, every news article that gets, somebody wrote it, somebody has an agenda, whatever. So, you know, uh, you know, it's 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 very frustrating. I, I'm not I'm not diminishing anything that that happened, or anything that might have happened. But be careful what you believe, because somebody is trying to you know lead you along. They're trying to hook you. Um, yeah. Up until October seventh, the Middle East was this sort of yeah, you know, yeah, things are going on and whatever. You know, Israel Netanyahu's having problems over the Supreme Court of Israel and. You know, the internal Israeli politics and the whole Arab street was kind of quiet and Israel was making a deal maybe with Saudi Arabia. We're going to normalize relations and, you know, all these sorts of things, you know, and then boom, you know, October 7th happened. And I wrote about this in, in Strategic Intelligence not too long ago. And, mm -hmm. and, and what this is this October 7th was a raid, obviously, into Israel, killed a lot of people, brutal, disgusting, horrible I mean, war criminal level stuff. And they GoPro'd it. They they filmed it with their cell phones and people were broadcasting, you know, hey, mom, guess what I did? I just killed, you know, a bunch of Jews. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to fake some of that. It's hard to fake that stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, so, but it was designed to be an outrageous, outrageous provocation. Well, why? What were they doing? Well, because the action was designed to spark a reaction from Israel. I mean, who plan you know, this thing did not just happen. These guys did not just sort of wake up on Saturday morning and say, hey, let's go, you know, let's go attack Israel. No, this thing was planned. They brag about it. They spent two years planning this thing. They, they, they had to train. They had to acquire materiel. They, they you, you, you may have seen those little paragliders that people were doing, the little Mad Max things. I mean, it, it, I mean somebody has to learn how to fly those things. I mean, and so they acquired things. There, there had to have been all sorts of signals and intelligence and people talking and 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 the, and the Israelis say, oh, this was an intelligence failure. Uh, I'm going to wait for the, the the Warren Commission, so to speak, to to kind of get into this. You know, the, the Pearl Harbor Commission to get into this. You know, but uh, you know, you can't tell me that there weren't signals and ind indications and warnings out there. Yeah. But it, yeah. You know, it still happened. And but now what? Well, it's it's the kickoff, you know. The, the the idea was to enrage Israel and and develop a reaction, and we're seeing the reaction. Obviously, you know the, the Israelis, you know, took them took them a while to get their act together. It took them four or five hours to get their military act together and kick the invaders out on October seventh. Then they mobilized the reserves. They brought the army out. They brought the tanks out of the out of the you know compounds and everything. And boom, we're going to invade Gaza. Well, well, now what's the reaction? The reaction is, oh, Israel is overreacting. Israel is waging a disproportionate response. They're, you know, the, the, the people who did this on October 7th, yeah, they're bad guys, but you're punishing the innocent people. You're punishing the civilians, the, the grandmothers and the babies and the children and the, 
you know, the, you know, just the people, the, the old people, the, the people that had, had nothing to do with this. They 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 weren't anywhere near, you know, Israel on October seventh. They had nothing to do with it. No fingerprints. No nothing. Uh, but you're punishing them. You're starving them. You're bombing them. You're blowing up their cities. You shut off their water. You shut off their food. Okay, so this is a very Sun Tzu kind of thing here. You, you're going to defeat your enemy without really waging a war. You know, I mean, I mean, obviously there's fighting going on. You know, the Hamas yeah, guys yeah. are blowing up Israel tanks, and the Israelis are blowing up tunnels. And yeah, there's that going on. But Israel is being degraded across the world as a legitimate nation. I mean, we, now in the U.S. and the West, we're like, oh, you know, oh, Israel's still na nation state. Other countries in the world, Bolivia, for example, you know, and others, and are 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 they're breaking diplomatic relations with Israel? They're kicking the Israeli ambassador out. Um, um, you know, and so we're seeing across the world this this anti-Israel as a state um, uh, reaction. Uh, meanwhile, whatever the Israelis were going to do with Saudi Arabia and the rest of the Middle East, that's all that's all on hold if it's not, you know, completely unwinding. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just, you know, the Israel angle to it. Now we have the whole larger geopolitical angle to it. I mean, I'm I'm old enough, you know, that some of our viewers might be old enough. Many probably aren't. But I'm old enough to remember the 1973 Israel war, Syria. Uh, Egypt got together, you know, Egypt attacked across the Suez Canal, Syria attacked down north, you know, from north. Um, and it was it was brutal. The U.S. went whole hog, absolutely all out to help Israel. I mean, I remember the the C-5 airplanes hauling every every kind of supply and equipment you can have over to Israel. Um, and, um, and, and that really enraged the Arab world. They wound up putting an oil embargo on oil to the West, to the United States. And, and that quadrupled oil prices. I mean, oil prices mm -hmm. went from, you know, this, these are going to be weird numbers to a contemporary audience. They went from like $4 a barrel, $5 a barrel, to like $15 and $18 and $20 a barrel. And we think, well, that's cheap. No, this was back then. This was in 1973. Different world, different money back then. But they quadrupled the price of oil. And, and that it totally wrecked the U.S. economy in so many ways. I mean, we went into a recession. Uh, it led to, it led on a good news, it led to building the Alaska pipeline, it built, led to building the strategic petroleum reserve in the U.S. Those are other outcomes from it. But, uh, but so, so now today, you know, in, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, okay, we're dealing, you know, they're, they're delegitimizing Israel. Hmm, okay. Uh, the Israeli relations with the rest of the world are breaking down. Hmm, okay. Um, and uh, what, what's this going to do to the price of oil? I mean, it, are, are, if, you look at a map of the Middle East, you know, pretty familiar map, right? You know, there's Africa on the left, there's Arabia in the middle, Iran, India, you know, Europe up in the northwest there, you know. Um, you know, when you look at the, when you look at the, uh, at the, at the Strait of Hormuz, for example, down where it says United Arab Emirates, you know, look at, look yep. at that. I mean, something like what, you know, 20% of the world's oil every day comes through that one strait, you know, and uh, if, if somebody drops a few, you know, water mines, sea mines in that water, boom, the tankers aren't going to move, you know. Well, much of the oil from that part of the region happens to go to Asia anymore. It goes to China. You know, I mean, yeah, sure, some goes to Europe, some a little bit comes to the U.S., not that much, but most of it goes to China. So, so that might not happen. But And then look further south, um, southwest down towards Djibouti, you know, Yemen, Ethiopia, that, that tiny little strait there. Uh, uh, Yemen down there. You see Yemen. Yemen has fired missiles at, at Israel. Uh, Yemen shot cruise missiles towards Israel, which wound up getting shot down. But uh, Yemen has declared war on Israel. So if Yemen somehow decides that, you know, they, they want to close that little uh, strait down there in the Gulf of Aden, you know, that, that could be miserable. I mean, I don't want to be too apocalyptic. I'll just say that, you know, we could see oil go from, you know, from 80, 80 bucks a barrel or 90 bucks a barrel. We could, we could see oil at $200 or 250 $300 if, if something happens to a major um, uh, choke point, a, a line of communication where much of the world's oil goes through. Yeah. And what and do you I, think that does? Like, is it, is it proportionate to gasoline prices? What do you think gasoline prices do at that point? I mean, they're... Oh, uh, yeah, gasoline prices will go from let's say recently. I don't know. I think I bought gas for I don't know three but three ninety nine a gallon or something like that. I uh, I we would probably be paying you know uh, ten ten bucks a gallon, maybe twelve, you know thereabouts. You know, I mean, you, you'll 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 triple your gas prices. Uh, diesel diesel will go from you know 
whatever it is, you know, four and a half, five bucks a gallon, go to 15, 18 bucks, five bucks a gallon. You know, I mean, it would just be, it would be a heart attack to the Western. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so Byron, I wanted to get your, your take on this because you spent a ton of time in the Navy as a pilot, you've been in this neighborhood and give us, uh, get us caught up. Cause I know you wrote this for strategic intelligence, but get us caught up in anyone that didn't read that or whatever, like, what is actually happening here now that this war is escalating? Because the U.S. now has assets over there. Give us a give us a rundown of that. If you want me to keep this map up, um, I know you've got another map as well. We can pull that up. But uh, just let me know where to go. But get, get everyone caught up. What's the U.S. military doing over there right now? Okay, well, we'll, we'll keep this map for for a, for a, a little bit of time here. Um, in the olden days, uh, in the in the eighties and the nineties and the two thousands. The U.S. always kept an aircraft carrier right about right in the Arabian Sea there, Gulf of Oman. You know, you, we always kept something up north there or even we had carriers, a, a carrier or two, even in the Persian Gulf. Uh, often as, and often the carriers would sail down into the Gulf of Aden, the Red Sea, things like that. It was always sort of to keep, uh, you know, keep a military presence there uh, with, you know, with a ship with, you know, pick a number, 60, 70, 80 combat aircraft on it, lots of lots of ammunition and everything else. Uh, uh, lots of command and control, you know, keep it in that region. Uh, in recent years, uh, that there we have much less of a presence in, uh, a naval presence there. Uh, and then in terms of like Saudi Arabia for, for years, decades, I mean, we had, you know, a large air force element there. We had army elements, you know, intelligence gathering elements. Uh, those troops, those planes, those people, you know, they're, they're mostly gone. They're not there so much anymore, you know, uh, there, you know, there's a there's a small presence. Uh, Iraq speaks for itself. I mean, we invaded the place. We had, had an army there. That's not there anymore. Uh, we have a few. We have some troops in Syria. You know, why are they there? You know, we could we could discuss that all day. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, now what kind of carriers? Like, is it when I know I've seen it on the news, and I want to get our our viewership like the the inside scoop, right? Because you can hear it both ways. Like, oh, this is really bad, or it's not that bad, or whatever. But give us an idea, because like, I mean. There, we've sent a second carrier strike group over, which is a big deal. Give us right. an insight into that and, and what you think that means. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, now, before October 7th, when everything was just sort of, you know, the Middle East was not erupting like a volcano, you know, uh, before that, there was one carrier in the Mediterranean area, oh, the Mediterranean Sea up in the north northwest there. Uh, and, and that was a, a brand new ship called the, the Gerald Ford. It's the new class of a carrier. It had a lot of teething problems, I guess. You know, it had too much too much new technology, and they had to work a lot of problems out. But they but then you know, they they got most of the problems ironed out, and the, and the carrier was over there just doing kind of a routine deployment. And then boom, October seventh happened. You know? uh, so, okay, well now it's time to sail over towards the Middle East or towards the you know towards the Israel the Eastern Med, you might say, Eastern Mediterranean. That is just pure Washington D.C. muscle memory. You know, that's every time there's a problem, the the uh, the politicians, the policymakers, oh hey, you know, where's the aircraft carriers, man? Where's the carriers? Where's the carrier? Where's the nearest? How many jets they got? You know, whatever. Okay, oh the Gerald Ford's over there. Okay, good. Put it in the Eastern Met. It's a show of presence. You know, really, it's sort of like okay, yeah, you know, we're whatever's going on, we're we got our carrier there. We have a bunch of airplanes, you know, radar in the sky. We can put combat jets up. We, we have lots of command and control. And it's not just one aircraft carrier. It's the, the battle group with the destroyers and the missiles and the radar coverage and the supply ships and the intelligence ships. And then there's these ships that they sail underwater. I forget what they're called. I don't know, submarines or something like that. We don't talk about those, but, you know, but you, you never know. You know, there's there, there's something floating around underneath the water there, you know. Probably, and I'm not that I can confirm that, but uh, it would not surprise me at all. Then the next thing that happened, more muscle memory in Washington, was kind of go, well, that's one carrier is good. If one carrier is good, two carriers are better. What do we got? Oh, we got the USS Dwight Eisenhower, the aircraft carrier. And there it was tied up at the pier at Norfolk in Virginia. And But it was ready to deploy. It was more or less ready, but, you know, it's kind of like it wasn't scheduled. They said, get everybody on that ship and, you know, sailor, sailor east, you know, so... So anyhow, so they make, you know, make, uh, make, make headway towards the Middle East. And it's, you know, it's pretty much there now, you know, uh, you know, two, so two carriers, two air wings, and yeah. then a whole lot of other things on the ground, you know, Greece, Cyprus, um, 
you know, Southeast, uh, you know, in, in, in the Balkans recently, you know, uh, uh, believe it or not, Bulgaria is a big uh, area for, you know, for U.S. staging. Uh, Italy, obviously, you know, Sicily, Italy, you uh, know, base in, in Italy. So there's a lot going on there. Uh, and so it's muscle memory that we have put a big whack of the Navy in the Eastern Med. Now, let's let's go to that other chart, that, uh, that other map that we have. This is a map of the Eastern Med, obviously. And you see all yeah, this. So this is, and you've got Israel there and yeah, Saudi Arabia is down here. So this is zoom in on the Mediterranean. Yeah, yeah. Now, now Russia. All, yeah, and there's Russia up there in the green there. Um, now, this is a this is a map that you're not going to see on the front page of the New York Times. OK, uh, this is from a. Uh, a, 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 a Russian source, friend, a dear friend of mine who, who likes to make maps. And uh, basically, he is showing the Eastern Med from a Russian perspective. You know, up there in the Black Sea, you've got those little red jets. Those would be MiG-31s that can carry these missiles called the Kinshal, which are these hypersonic missiles that can, you know, have uh, you know, thousands of kilometer range, you know. The, the circles down around Syria with all the little airplanes and all the little ships and stuff like that, that's the Russian set of bases in uh, in Syria. They have a naval port there, and they have an air, uh, an air base in Syria. Uh, they have a lot of people. They have planes. They have surface air missiles. They have radar coverage. Uh, and then 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 you know, do not discount just general Russian intelligence. They have satellites in the sky. They have incredible. Uh, uh, radar systems that over the horizon kinds of things that can literally look around, you know, the curvature of the earth based on bouncing mm -hmm. you know, ra radar waves off the ionosphere, things like that. Uh, they have very, very, very good coverage. And those arrows that you see with the little arcs and such in the Eastern Mid, those are various uh, missile ranges for different kinds of missiles, surface air missiles, anti-ship missiles, things like that. Those didn't used to be a thing. Those didn't used to be a problem. In the olden days, you would put your you would put an American aircraft carrier in the Eastern Med. It's kind of like, yeah, we own the place. It's ours, you know. Now, from a military planning standpoint, if you are deciding where where, where we're going to put the carriers, where we're going to put the ships, the surface ships, the supply ships, the command and control, whatever, you've got to think about. Wait a minute, they, the Russians they have these missiles that you know they've been shooting them at Ukraine, so we know they work. You know, we we know they fly yeah. through. Are, we know they hit where they aim, you know, um, and uh, the, the military planners have to be burning buckets of midnight oil on this, thinking about, well, you know, uh, you know, uh, now, obviously, we're not at war. We are not at war with Russia other than the proxy war in Ukraine. You know, I mean, other, other than that, you know, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the play? You know, but um, uh, but anybody who has even the slightest familiarity with with, you know, uh, planning, you know, that. Uh, event planning, military planning, has to consider, you know, what happens when we put our ships here, great big, huge, you know, thousand foot long pieces of steel that float in the water, you know, hundred feet high off the, off the, off the surface, you know, big pieces, you know, those things are also called targets, you know, now, the, now the good news about an aircraft carrier is that it can move at 30 knots and it's not like a fixed base that, that can't move at all, but, but still, you know, in, in the modern world, um, you know, big ship, big target. Um, so you have, you have to think about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what would where, be what would be like? Go? You know, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, where's it go? Well, the idea, you know, Israel and Hamas, Israel and Gaza, they've got their they've got their fight on on there. I mean, they have joined the fight. They're fighting each other. They're fighting like hell. They're killing each other. They're blowing each other up. Blow up the tunnels. Blow up the tanks. You know, kill your guys. They kill our guys. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's terrible. It's it's horrible. It's happening. And the world is like, oh, oh, shame. You know, we need a ceasefire. We need a pause and everything. That's virtue signaling. Everybody can say, oh, I told you, I told you all to ceasefire. And the Israelis are like, no, we're taking care of these people. We're going to wipe them out to the last man. And, you know, you're, you're looking at just the raw anger between, you know, the Israelis and the Palestinians. You're looking at just the utter hatred, the utter disgust and the loathing they feel for each other. It's finally back. It's up at the surface here. You know, it is a it has surfaced and it's foaming at the, you know, the foaming at the foaming at the top. That's where it's at. Um, I don't know. I don't know what we on the outside, you know, we observers from afar, you know, can can really do to to change those emotions. You know, I mean, emotions have to or have to play out. Um, you know, people say, well, you shut off the aid to Israel. Well, that's that's one of those political decisions. You know, I mean, Washington's going to provide aid to Israel and. Iran is going to provide aid to Hamas, and then Turkey is going to provide, you know, 
diplomatic and moral and maybe even military aid, who knows? Uh, if that's gonna, the adults in the room, the big people, the big kids, you know, the USA and Russia, and, to, and China actually has ships in the region too, that, that China place, you know, the PRC. Uh, the adults in the room ha have a great interest in, you know, if this thing's gonna, if there's gonna be a war, we need to keep this war like tight. We need to keep it controlled. You know, we wanna keep it keep where it's at, you know? We do not want to start, you know, seeing, you know, anti-ship missiles, you know, whizzing across the Eastern Med. Or we don't want to, you know, we, you know, we don't want to send in U.S. airstrikes, you know, blowing up, uh, you know, blowing up, you know, Palestine targets or something like that. Uh, and th this is this is where, you know, the I, I don't know. I don't know how much I really trust the brain trust of uh, civilian policymakers in Washington and Europe. Um I, I, I do have some faith that the military planners who actually, you know, have, you know, it's their ships, it's their airplanes, it's their pilots. And I think, I think they, they have a lot of, uh, they, 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 they're, they're working to exercise restraint where they can. So, so, yeah. so, we'll, so we'll see where it goes. But in terms of how this thing can evolve as an outsider looking in, uh, the fight is going to happen until it stops and then it's going to be tough. Uh, watch the price of oil. Watch other things that have to do with Western credibility, U.S. credibility, the, the strength of the dollar, uh, price of gold, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Can we talk? I want to talk two things. One, like what would be a worst case scenario or how could this esca escalate dramatically from a military standpoint? And then two, I want to talk a little bit more along those same lines into oil, because obviously this region is all about oil. So I want to talk oil infrastructure and how that could in, in affect the price and maybe some investments around that. So, But first, military escalation. What could happen that could asymmetrically start escalating this thing? Okay. Right now, the bulk of the fighting is Israel-Hamas uh, is in, in Gaza. Gaza is the, you know, and in a sense... I think that one of the Hamas ideas was we're going to pull Israel into Gaza and we're going to give them a Stalingrad, Stalingrad 2.0. Fighting in the cities is horrible. The buildings are collapsed. Every, you know, but every collapsed building is a place for snipers and a place for guys with RPGs and you know whatever. Um, the next phase of that would be: could there be an invasion from the north? You know, could Hezbollah in uh, in Lebanon and Syria? But they decide, OK, it's, this is uh, this is our opportunity. Israel's all tied up down south at Gaza. Let's let's kick off into northern Israel. Let's launch the missiles. Let's go for the Golan Heights, which is a big a, a geographical feature, big mountain area that, you know, lots, lots of lots of water. Actually, it's a big watershed, you know, uh, and, and let's just let's just march on Golan. You know, let's take that. Next thing you know, now Israel has a two front war south and north. Worse than that, a three front war, because in the West Bank of the Jordan River, you know, where the where the. Lots and lots of Palestinians live. Let's say they have an uprising too. Well, they're not terribly well armed. It's not like it, it's not like you can really smuggle, you know, guns and bombs and everything else into into that area. The Israelis have that pretty tight. But just suppose there's just riots in the street. You know, you just you, people can't drive down the street without you know without getting a rock through their window or something like that. Israel could have a three front war. You know, mm -hmm. and 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 Israel, you know, it's small. It's got certain. It's got a limited population. Um, and uh, in in the sense that that, that the Israeli escalation against the the uprisings, either the invasion from the north, the fight in the south, uprising in the middle, if if the Israelis really crack down hard on that, you know that could trigger even more outside intervention. You know, other things that can happen. Israel is over here, and Iran is over there. We saw that on the map. They are not connected to each other. There's not going to be any big tank battles between the Israeli tanks and the Iranian tanks. No, no, that's not going to happen. But is but Iran has long range missiles that are that have pretty good accuracy and they can they can drop them on Israel. So if something if 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 a third party, if Iran especially was to shoot missiles now, would Iran do that? Well I you know I I I think not, but you know, but you never rule it out. Um it, Yemen, as I mentioned earlier, Yemen has already fired Missiles, cruise missiles, and, and and ballistic type missiles at Israel, uh, which means they had to fire them. They had to shoot them up the Red Sea. They had to fire them over Saudi Arabia. So I mean, Yemen has you know crossed that uh, crossed that sort of military Rubicon there. Um, and yeah. now other things that can happen, just weird weird stuff, just bad crap that can happen. I mean, um, could could some anti ship missile come out of wherever? 
and you know aimed at a U.S. ship. I mean, so, you know, if a U.S. ship, you know, obviously we have defensive systems on our ships. We have radars. We have things. You know, they see a missile coming in. Boom! Out we, you know, out goes our missiles. Out goes our, you know, anti-aircraft mm-hmm. system. Whatever. Shoot it down. Okay, you know, uh, but uh, that 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 would that would make people mad on the U.S. side. You know, I mean, uh, would uh, would the U.S. conduct airstrikes on Gaza, airstrikes in Syria? You know, I mean, do we want it now? You know, now especially in Syria, are, do we want to fly U.S. airplanes through the those as I showed on the other map, those Russian air defense systems? Do we want to do that? Oh, you know, yikes! You know, uh, all of those things are very very problematic, and they all get. They all get war game. They all get planned out in the staffing and the and the planning. Uh, and uh, like I said, I mean, planners everywhere are burning twenty four hours a day, just buckets of midnight oil, trying to figure yeah. this stuff out. So then, talking about oil, let's just talk about oil infrastructure because I mean, luckily over the last decade or two, the, the U.S. has started producing more oil. Mm-hmm. So, like, luckily we're the world's top oil producer, but. Second and third are Saudi Arabia and, and Russia. Russia. So Saudi Arabia is there. They have a ton of oil assets. Like you said, 20% of the oil is coming out of that one little strait. You've got tons going through the Suez Canal. Um, what could happen there? What are some what are some things that could escalate? And this is more for the viewership at home. This could happen overnight, right? All of a sudden, you Absolutely. wake up and some big oil infrastructure from the number two oil producer in the world goes offline that could take a third of the world's oil, you know, like not that much, but a large chunk um, and oil prices just go crazy. So Byron, give us an idea of what that could look like. What, what infrastructure is over there that could be in jeopardy or someone that's thinking, you know, if Hamas has the hidden agenda to get reactions out of Israel. Are there other things they're thinking up for, mm-hmm. for global oil? Oh, well, think about this. I mean, uh, just, just imagine that somebody, blew up a ship in the Suez Canal, for example. Remember, it was like a year and a half, two years ago, that, that ship that sort of yeah. got caught crosswise in the Suez Canal, it just grounded itself. It hit a it hit a sandbar and it completely screwed up the world economy for months, you know, just until, I mean, it took a couple of weeks to get the ship out of there. And But then they had this backlog of cargo that couldn't go through. That was a peacetime event, just a, a ship hit a sandbar. You know, if somebody... It uh, sinks a ship in the Suez Canal and blocks it for some reason. Um, that will interrupt world trade, not just oil, but everything, yeah. cargo, food, you know, you name it. It's all, you know, automobiles from Asia, you know, part, you know everything. It's just that that could be a complete mess. Uh, if, uh, you know, I mean, if if Iran, it would be, I mean, it would be Iran, if Iran decided to close the Strait of Hormuz for some reason, again, you're looking at oil prices tripling, you know, within a matter of, couple of days probably you know uh, uh, if, if, if it became evident that that's a long-term situation uh, Saudi Arabia has uh, just a couple of oil loading facilities if somebody sabotaged them or if they got hit by a missile from someplace you know if, if somebody just blew up the pumping system blew up the power system to the pumps blow blew up the certain parts of the pipeline or whatever mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Saudi oil could go offline for weeks or months. You know, uh, uh, Iran is a is is a major oil exporter. I mean, we don't think of it as that because it's been under so many embargoes. But but Iran sells a lot of oil to the Chinese. I can't imagine that the Chinese would appreciate you know something bad happening to the loading facilities that uh, Iran is. I think it's called Karg Island. You know, they, um, but uh, yeah, um, I mean those kinds of things. I mean. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's not like somebody's going to go out and blow up every oil well in the oil field or something. The, you know, people will still be producing oil, okay, and and people will still be hopefully loading it on tankers. Okay, great. But if but if you can't get the tanker through the Strait of Hormuz or if you can't get the tanker through the Suez Canal, um, that's a, there's a problem for you. You know, uh, if if at a political level, if if uh, the Arab world says, okay, it's going to be 1973 again. You know, we're we're mad at the U.S. We're mad at Europe for giving too much support to Israel. This, you know, you're you're not being balanced here. You know, we're gonna we're gonna embargo your oil. There's there's your there's your oil prices doubling overnight. You know, or over a week. You go to, you you shut your computer off on Friday afternoon, and you you know you paint your house over the weekend. You wake up Monday morning, the price of oil has gone up a hundred percent. You know, it's like, hmm, you know. Um, what are some ways? We look at these things a lot of times, Paradigm Press with Jim Rickards yourself. We're looking at asymmetrical bets, uh, things that in the investing world, 
that you've just got, you know, things could go crazy one way, but they can't get too, too, they can't change too much the other way. What would be some investments that you like, probably like bigger, safer plays if oil does that? If oil goes to 200 bucks a barrel, right. where, what companies do you like? What are, what are some ways that like yeah, people could play the upside of that? Cause again, we would feel the pressure on prices, but this would be a way to, to balance that out with some sort of, uh, Good safety and and upside investments. Oh sure, absolutely. The, the 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 safe bets, the asymmetrical bets, would be large integrated oil companies. You know, Exxon Mobil, Chevron, uh, ConocoPhillips, uh, internationals. You know, BP, Shell. Uh, those guys have very minimal downside in the sense that you know they're they're, they're already under undervalued in my humble opinion. Uh, they have plenty of upside, and in a world where oil spikes, uh, they have a lot of upside in a hurry. Uh, meanwhile, they're nice dividend-paying companies, and so you know you get paid to wait. Uh, they, you know, Exxon, Chevron, etc., they are going to do well anyhow, just for all sorts of reasons in the West, like you know, oh, we hate oil, uh, and we want to go to electric cars. That's that. There's a whole argument there that that's fallacious. All they're doing is giving the future market to the legacy oil companies anyhow. Uh, Exxon, Chevron, you know, the refiners like Marathon and or Valero, they were going to do well anyhow. They're going to yeah, do yeah. really well in, in a world where the Middle East has gone. Byron, that's an amazing rundown. Again, your background from the military and your background as a petroleum geologist, knowing your way around oil and energy. Um, amazing breakdown there. Everyone at home, thank you so much for tuning in. Any other comments that you have, put them below. Please like this video. And if you want more stuff like this, I'd love for you to do us a favor. Go ahead, subscribe to our channel. We're getting this thing moving. We want to get you more stories. We want to get you the narrative that you know, you're not hearing from the mainstream. And it's, uh, it's the inside take. So we'll be digging for those stories. Go ahead, subscribe to the channel. Give us a like. And we'll see you next time.